Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Airlock, and these are my two cats over here, the tiger and the little Leo, the snowball, the snow goat. And I'm here to talk to you a bit about philosophy, German idealism, before German pessimism, everybody's favorite subjects, yippee skippy, as we'll get to with Schopenhauer. But before all that, we're going to talk a bit about Fichte in this talk, and then in another short talk a bit about Schelling, and then we will be set up between Kant and Hegel for Hegel. So that said, much happiness, and hopefully, uh, yes, enjoy the talks. So the popular contemporary theorist Zizek published a massive work on Hegel entitled Less Than Nothing, which I actually did peruse and purchase, and then continued to peruse, uh, and I will be getting into some of Zizek's work as we make our way through the modern European philosophy class. But for our purposes, in the opening pages, which I certainly read, in the introduction, which is usually what of Hegel's work a lot of people read, uh, Zizek said that all of philosophy before the critique of pure reason was a mere precursor to Kant, and that the 50 years between the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781 and the death of Hegel in 1831 was the critical time of philosophical development in Europe. It was the time that Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, whom Zizek calls the Gang of Four, which he knows is a bit Maoist and, uh, and of Maoist China, changed continental philosophy forever. Uh, Fichte and Schelling are often presented as a bridge between the thinking of Kant and Hegel, and that's what I'm going to be doing. So in this talk, and then the next talk, which will likely be briefer still, although I'll delve a little into Neoplatonism in that talk, as I promised too for the modern European class, and we didn't really get into that just yet, so we're going to briefly examine the central ideas of Fichte in this talk and Schelling and his Neoplatonism in the next talk, and then we will be ready for a talk on Hegel's phenomenology and then another on Hegel's logic, all of which is sometimes neglected by Americans but is very important for the bridge and the then divide uh, from here to then continental philosophy and the parting of ways of analytic and continental philosophy after Kant. So, following Kant, I have mentioned, phenomenologists are concerned with the systematic ways we experience things, the ways that they appear for us as phenomena and provide the structure and arrangement of our shared reality. And yes, somebody has already done the Muppets phenomena do 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 thing. I did watch a band, there was a band for a while called the Dead Hensons instead of the Dead Kennedys which is wonderfully tasteless, of course, just like the Dead Kennedys, and they performed a bunch of Muppet music, and people loved the living heck of it. And they would tease people with a couple of drops into a and then they wouldn't do that song, and then in, towards the end of the show, they would drop into that, and everybody lost it because a bunch of people grew up with the Muppets and all of that. Of course, they weren't talking about German idealism nor phenomenology, but phenomenology is a fancy word for, we had Hume, all is uh, prejudi prejudice, habit, and assumption is truth and meaning gathered through experience. Kant says yes, but there's a shape to the glasses and the blank slate we are. And so phenomenology is a bunch of wrestling with all of that in German thought. Technically, there is still phenomenology going on. It is, again, sort of a school, like rationalism is technically going on still, but uh, these are sort of names of past movements that are still plenty influential on a bunch of things and people. So, as I mentioned the first week, British and American analytic philosophy broke from continental German and French tradition after Kant. Kant is very much the watershed, uh, which is apparently I actually looked up at some point using the term, and I don't use the term that often, is very much the V in the river, like the delta, where effectively, and notice my nautical knowledge is not, that uh, there's a fork in the river, you know, and you got to go kind of one way, or one way or another. Um, it's a breaking, you know, turning moment of uh, of things, and it's a moment where you have to sort of make a decision. And there is a widening of a gap between neo-Kantian analytic philosophy that follows uh, decently in the 1900s. So still after the 1800s and all of this, we're talking about the 1800s now and begin. Well, we're still talking about the late 1700s. My apologies. We're talking about the late 1700s, early 1800s. Technically, analytic philosophy is going to get going in the 1900s. 
but it very much here with Kant and then analytic philosophy is going to go back to neo Kant, uh, back to Kant and neo Kantianism in the 1900s. So Hegel and others and phenomenology are going to do stuff that then actually the analytic uh, American and Anglophonic tradition is going to reject, which we got to talk about all that before we can reject it, of course, and get back and forth about it. So, the continental tradition, the, the Germans and then the French, effectively. Traditionally, uh, they follow Kant in being difficult to understand and long-winded, though deep and meaningful for those who take the time to understand. Um, Martin Jay, who is a renowned expert on the Frankfurt School, and I had the great fortune of in grad school, I, took, I got my master's with the Graduate uh, Theological Union in Berkeley, California, where I studied... Buddhist and Christian and uh, Greek and Indian and Chinese thought, and then also modern thought and picked up as much as I could as a whole smorgasbord, which is why I did my studies there, and I took grad classes at Cal, and so uh, my alma mater for undergrad. And I got to take a year, uh, two se semester seminars with Martin Jay, and he taught me some Hegel via Marcusa in the Frankfurt School. Um, so with all of that... I got a background in some German and then modern takes on German thought, uh, something fierce. And I actually ended up writing my master's thesis on Hegel and his reception of Neoplatonism, which is actually going to get very shelling in the next talk. This first is Fichte. But I pick up a lot of this stuff as the junction of Greek ancient stuff coming into modern German and then modern European thought. I happen to know... <sighs> Without claiming to be, again, a super expert in anything specifically uh, Greek or German, I try to be somebody who knows a whole smorgasbord of stuff about philosophy and the history of thought as a generalist. And actually knowing the Greek to the German dance step is a huge uh, bit of importance for a bunch of Europeans and Western people. You may have heard of some of them. I have some white people in my family, I am ashamed to say. Again, a few too many. But all of that aside, you know, and all of these sentiments and feelings, most romantically, a little too romantically for Hegel, that's uh, Martin J. basically taught me some Hegel via Marcusa, and he, I heard him say that reading Hegel is very much like wading through a swamp, and also me learning to talk in English or German. I certainly uh, can talk in one of them there. So uh, Heidegger and other continental thinkers who were each vying to be the next Kant or Hegel in the German philosophical tradition very much follow this tradition. Funny enough, I have to say, I do like continental thoughts uh, very much. Continental thought and German and French philosophy can be notoriously difficult to read. Now, this is the kind of thing where if you're an expert or you really like stuff, hey, the very difficult could be really cool for you. It is the kind of thing where a lot of these ideas are very important for uh, modern times in our own day. And understanding a lot of the basics of German thinkers is understanding the basics of French thinkers, and especially post-war French thinkers. That means 50s, 60s, 70s, existentialism, structuralism, post-structuralism, post-modernism. And I do know from looking at my view counts and stuff on here... Postmodernism is a whole lot of what people want to talk about nowadays. It makes sense to me. If you want to talk postmodernism, we have to start talking post-Kant German and then French thought. We have to start talking continental thought, and continental thought very much starts going with hardcore right-wing German nationalist proto-Nazi Fichte, uh, funny enough, even though this is going to go way left-wing plenty for a lot of Frenchies and communist folks, you know, much later, which is a whole lot of intellectual history, whether you like or hate German. Germans or communists or not, you know, via Marx and other Germans, etc., and assorted French people. So if you are going to know a lot, and I do recommend understanding, if you want to be semi somewhat self-taught intellectual, you probably want to uh, understand the basics of German and French philosophy. Americans are notoriously bad at that, um, but I did get good classes, and I have in this town, in all of this stuff. Again, it is still from an analytic angle a lot of the times. It's still in the Anglophonic world, so it's still neo-Kantian taught. But Martin Jay is not very neo-Kantian, as far as I understand. Um, and there are folks, again, in the town, uh, Dreyfus has passed recently, he is a big Heideggerian, who understand a bunch of why Fichte and Heidegger and their ideas are important, regardless of what you think of Germans and the Nazis, and Fichte and Heidegger's involvement with all of that. Or Hegel and his uh, student follower, uh, not direct student, but a student follower, uh, the most famous left-wing Hegelian is Marx, 
So if you kind of want to know about the Nazis or right wing or left wing thinking or a bunch of stuff or anything hip that's French, including surrealism. After I'm done with all these lectures on German and French thought, I'm going to get into surrealist works of art and start making YouTube videos about surrealist uh, movies I love, and I will have all the videos up to start talking about the basics of all of that. If you want to know about art, about modern thought, you probably should know the basics of German thought and then know the basics of French stuff. So, knowing Fichte, even though he is very much a proto-Nazi, is important for Martin Jay, and all of that is important for me. All of this stuff is very interesting, important stuff, but the thing is, a lot of times people don't boil it down into simple ideas, and so that's what I do here on YouTube and in the classes I teach. And I really love teaching the basics, and I really watch people light up with it, because these are the genius thoughts that people had, whether you like or hate them as individuals or their politics, and German to France to what we're doing now is a whole lot of our modern world. I will be arguing very much we are going and have been going from existential increasingly into postmodern times in counterculture and in culture in general. I watch the younger folks light up, you know, as I start talking more postmodern thought. If you really need to understand, you don't really need to understand anything. You know, we can blissfully enjoy our lives without much of understanding at all. I actually disagree with Socrates. The unexamined life is perfectly worth living. You know, it's all, all, almost uh, threateningly suicidal to suggest otherwise, and much love. You know, I mean, I know he's trying to poke and prod and gadfly people, but yeesh. So you don't have to understand German thought, but if you want to understand, like, the deeper roots of a lot of modernity, you need to know German and then French thought. That makes you hipper, that makes you more into surreal thought, that makes you more of an artist, it's kind of amazing. Again, it's just the intellectual background you should have if you want to know philosophy and art and culture today. I am going to be cracking into movies like Us and other things like that, which are, of course the latest of black American uh, horror, and and if you know German and French thought, you can crack into some of that, and Fanon and other things who's hanging out with Sartre. If you want to know Sartre, you want to know Fanon, you want to know black double consciousness in America, which is all stuff I love to talk about, and I will, you got to know a little bit of Fichte to a little bit of Hegel to a little bit of dance step. Martin Luther King Jr., like talking about Hegel, Martin Luther King Jr. was the kind of intellectual uh, who has, not only has a holiday, yeah, around here, but, and again, pretty sure in Arizona also, um, again, you can ask Chuck D about all that. I'm from, again, grew up in the 80s, children, for your time. But speaking of before all of our time, you got to know some of these Germanics and other folks pretty well, you know, whether you want to or not. So all of that is pretty important and amazing. So allow me to tell you about Fichte and several other seriously controversial German thinkers, and then we're going to talk a bunch of French controversial thinkers, as well as a bunch of other stuff in the course of all these lectures and talks. So, it is important, again, as I always tell people, to learn about IG, uh, German idealism and German pessimism before children learn about it on the street, you know, from the wrong kind of Germanics and the wrong kind of people. So, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who's the uh, sort of here the third German thinker we got here, who lived from 1762 to 1814, like Hegel and many of his day, was inspired by the French Revolution and Kant's critique, so much so that he tra went to Konigsberg, kind of like Wittgenstein went to see Frege and then Russell, he went to Konigsberg to meet Kant. Kant was not very impressed with this younger follower after a disappointing meeting, and so Fichte threw himself into work that would prove himself to Kant, and at first, his writings were considered to possibly be Kant anonymously writing uh, without putting his name to it himself. As a professor, like Schelling and then Hegel, Fichte taught many students who would go on to become central continental philosophers, such as Schopenhauer, who we're going to study in a couple of talks. Uh, he is the thinker after Hegel, the next famous guy, and the start of German pessimism, yippee skippy, which is a whole lot more romantic beyond reason, kind of passionate thought. Although what we're having here after Kant, uh, right here, up through Schopenhauer, is German thought starting to get more into the passions, like Hume. Remember, Hume says reason ought to be and is the slave and servant of and fruit of uh, the passions. And that is very German thought. Uh, not so Kant, but very much these folks. Um, after Fichte wrote a work arguing that there effectively was no God other than rational morality, which is very screamingly deist, and very much what Kant probably was but didn't say out loud, Fichte was, and this is, I believe, after Kant was uh, safely dead, 
Uh, Fichte was dismissed from his professorship for atheism, which again, deism and saying God's actually math and math is alive as the cosmos is technically, of course, at this time, atheism. Um, so, uh, well, not so technically, broadly, I suppose uh, we could say. So Kant had, n again, remembering no love for religious ceremony and very much argues for the purity of God in reason and morality and all that in our lives. Very much founding Father's Deus style around the same years. So like the realists mentioned last time, uh, the Scottish realists, naive realists, etc., not uh, neo-realists uh, and such, Fichte claimed that a gap between our experience and the objective thing leaves open the possibility of insurmountable skepticism in Kant's thing in itself. So like Hegel, uh, Fichte hears Kant and he cuts Kant off a little bit of the past and says, well, Kant can't technically say, may figuratively be speaking of, Hegel more directly accuses Kant of, posing a thing in itself that you can't ever reach, which is very much the tree falling in the forest itself, making the sound you and I never hear, which is no sound effectively at all. What Fichte is arguing uh, in the wood, in the Zen image, is that effectively the sound the tree makes in the forest is whatever sound is. So our reality is just mental representation and the sound and our ears hearing it out in the world. And the incompleteness of our representations, now this is a very tricky and interesting move, is part of the representations themselves. This is somewhat Neoplatonic. There is in Neoplatonism and what these Germans are studying and the stuff I actually studied uh, with the ancient and then the medieval and the modern Greek and then German thought, is that we do and don't know things with knowing and unknowing, and so we actually do and don't bound the world with our concepts. Think about that for a second. It's actually a very important idea that shoots right by, which may be important for me to point out right here. Let's say that my brain and mind are making my world right now. Let's assume that these guys are all increasingly getting into using a word like psychology. Uh, they want to talk psychology with you and I, right? Okay, good. So we have brains, and therefore I have many a time pointed around a classroom and suggested, unless we're the most naive of realists, so this is all kind of in our brains right now, effectively. And if you buy anything like that, which is fine, I don't not, I do, plenty, I leave open, because what you can say, of course, is like, okay, so this is all representing stuff. So where does your world end kind of over there or over there? You know, and it kind of doesn't. It's like, where does my cat behavior leave off? You know, well, it's kind of open-ended in the ways that we deal with things, right? So that's weird. If it's our brain or the world, how does it just remain open in ways? If it is the fixed world that's closed or if it is the fixed mind that's closed up with concepts... Why is it my world just kind of goes over that away and doesn't really add up? Or like the number line, I like to point out. It's like, oh, you know, there's an imaginary, is there an imaginary number line? Sure, it's arithmetic and it just goes on forever and I never see the end of it. Well, that's a very weird unicorn to believe in, isn't it? How does your mind, in any kind of way you believe in it, just represent numbers as going on forever? You and I know we can't know going on forever. Nicholas of Cusa says, as I mentioned um often when talking about medieval things, and I believe I did mention and have, uh, well, in context of logic, I'm not sure about these lectures and this playlist or what playlist have you, this is involved with here for you or what you have seen. But Nicholas of Cusa argues as a German mystic of the, I believe, actually, I think he's more, again, I, <laughs> screwing up my stuff. Culture gets complicated in the middle medieval ages. Um, no matter what language he's writing in or where he's originally from, Nicholas of Cusa says that a circle goes round and round, the Neoplatonic mystic, and you, your mind effectively must be immortal if you know a circle goes around forever. Piaget says the child of three or four gets confused if you say a circle goes around how, how much, but a child of five or six actually knows to say, oh, circles just go round and round. I don't know. How do we know how to do that? It is a Neoplatonic answer and very Schelling next to say, and Schelling remains so hard Neoplatonist uh, that he was a prodigy, but then he remained very much in Hegel's shadow because he really didn't sort of go beyond Neoplatonism to a more modern whole system of thought, the way Hegel very systematically took Schelling and his own thinking, kind of ripping Schelling off, but also Neoplatonism, which is a lot of what I studied, is that you close and open the world with your mind. What uh, I wrote my master's thesis actually on Eriugena, the 9th century mystic, which I should do a video, I need to do a couple of videos on the mystical uh, and Neoplatonist uh, philosophers in the middle here, Nicholas of Cusa says, God chooses to know and not know the world. 
in order to give us free will. Wittgenstein very much, I often say, and my mother is Catholic, and she's like, it's not Jehovah, that's not proper anymore. It's like, yes, but Wittgenstein does say, as I tell her, Wittgenstein says in many moments in thought, the Lord Jehovah may not know what's going on here. And he doesn't mean God couldn't know. He means something like objective reality could go multiple ways, kind of like Schrodinger's cat. This could go multiple ways here, and he actually is, what Wittgenstein is saying, is something like this, and he's of the German tradition and knows these guys decently, some of them, in spite of how much he's central to uh, Anglo-American analytic philosophy, is that we leave our minds open in certain ways with possibility and just my reality not ending up anywhere over there, which is weird because I'm representing my reality as both open and closed. I tell students all the time, and it's very Neoplatonist, knock, 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 that's the desk is closed, my hand is closed, around it is open, which weirdly means there's the possibility of moving openly around the hand, but there isn't in the closure of the hand. If you kind of buy that, that's your mind kind of psychologically leaving open your world and space. That non-being was discussed very specifically with things like Greek Platonists and others. So, effectively, you do have, in many ways, that our minds represent the world as open, and that is one of the first very brilliant German phenomenologist ideas here, which would certainly go into your toolbox our minds and concepts open and close the world. Don't just delineate and close the world. That's very bit steps beyond Kant. It is not the first time anybody said it because it's very Neoplatonic and it's very German and Neoplatonic mysticism, which these guys would get from Eckhart, Kusa, others. Again, I would actually have to look up, is Kusa living in Italy? I think so. It's like, and uh, yeah, let's just uh, skip over my lack of historical knowledge here and context. Is that I, uh, in quoting these people, your mind opens and closes the world mentally. And they're talking about that your mind is your world open and closed in the ways it's open and closed. That is one of the first ideas here. Say what you want about German nationalism and uh, Fichte being a proto-Nazi, which he certainly was. It is very interesting that our mental representations, if the world is our mental representation, the Buddha said, the world is our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world, which is very similar to German idealism, and Germans like Indian thought a little something fierce. Uh, in fact, again, uh, there's a little bit of swastika back and forth later for some of the Germans and, uh, well, the proto-Nazis along with followers of Fichte. We open and close, with our thoughts we make the world. Reality is our mental representation, as Schopenhauer says, and Schopenhauer thinks he's being a Buddhist about it, very specifically by name, and following Indian thought in his German, Germanic thinking. We leave the world open and close it up with our thinking. That is really one of the more interesting thoughts which you really need to understand in order to start going not just from Kant. Remember, Kant says there's black and white thinking possible. We need to black and white separate. He talks a lot like a positivist and like Russell. We need to separate the unknowable from the knowable, the black and white that can be closed, and then we need to black and white absolute all or none figure out what we can know. This is much more open than that in ways where Fichte, trying to follow Kant, is saying we leave the world open and close it up in ways. Hegel is going to run very far downfield with this because he sees in this a possibility of going well beyond Kant into history and practicality and real life. And of course, I love later Wittgenstein beyond Kant. This is forms of life in the world as we mentally live the world and our reality. Our reality and our mentalities are open and closed, not just, and that's the French Revolution for Hegel as a boy, the left and the right, which you may have heard of those last week uh, occasionally. With our mental realities, like the left, the openness of the left, the closure of the right, which of course both are open and closed in too many ways to count, the openness of the left and the closure of the right, which you may or may not be familiar with, that is Hegel pointing at the openness and closure of mentalities and saying we see history as a contradiction of forces, just like Neoplatonism represents the mind and the world for hundreds of years. So this is all very core to understanding how French people are going to use these German thoughts this way and that in the future here very very much i'm gonna check the uh yes we actually do have let's see here i have yes you can see a cat very back there any who's it's i will leave the camera again positioned here so you can see the cat yes all right then Trying to be a little dialectical, a little back and forth motion here. So, 
the that is one of the major ideas I want people to understand here, definitely, is that it's really interesting to stop here and realize what these guys are saying is not just that our minds make the world and our world consists of how we think socially for Fichte as well. This gets social beyond Kant next also is the next idea here. First and foremost, reality is open and closed because it is our thoughts and our minds. Then next we have the social, which of course makes the sense. Fichte argues that self-consciousness is a social phenomena, critical for future continental philosophy. Continental philosophy is going to be very much like Neoplatonic mysticism, that the world is open and closed with our thoughts. But unlike Kant and Neoplatonic mysticism, German thought like Marx gets social. Now we're talking about social Darwinism and plenty of stuff out in the world, and we're increasingly getting to Darwin with Nietzsche. Now we're talking about motions of history out in the world and Hegel watching the French Revolution go back and forth with the left and the right. So this is not just in the mind. Notice I have been mentioning human thought has very much been in the mind of the individual for Hume. And then I said with Hume, this isn't yet social forms out in the world as social forms of life with Wittgenstein. That's because we're still sort of in the individual mind with Kant and others, but it's getting more social with Fichte and others here in German thought as we go along. So not only do we have the central thought here of Fichte, reality's open and closed, which he gets from myst uh, Neopl Neoplatonism and Christian mysticism and Islamic mysticism and a bunch of interrelated stuff in the Middle Ages. But he also is then going to make this social. Now, Kant liked walking past grandfather clocks with his mouth closed. Apparently, he was fun at parties and at social gatherings and had quite a sense of humor. But he was, well, as we all are, a bit closed and indoors about all of that and a bit type A plenty in his behavior. Fichte, regardless of how in a box he wants us or society, yeesh, is going to be a bit more social. Again, yeesh as well. So the analytic tradition oftentimes is accused of being somewhat ahistorical and antisocial in the sense that it wants to be kind of neo-Kantian into the objective pure truth, but somewhat avoids the Hegelian dialectics back and forth of the social out in the world, and continental thought tends to like being rough and tumble subjective and historical out in the world, and more anthropological than something more mathematical and, and uh, hard objective math like analytic philosophy tries to be. So Descartes through Kant so far, uh, the modern Europeans, have considered self-consciousness a fundamental experience. But for Fichte, self-consciousness is social consciousness, and we form our social consciousness socially. That is Piaget, that is Hegel, that is all kinds of stuff. You know who you are as an individual, not from growing up in a closet, Kant, in many ways, talks about thought as if we can just think privately in a closet, and Descartes also talks that way, as if a pure reason just deductively and analytically unfolded by itself into math, we could have the whole world by ourselves. I tend to react very much against that, and I admit I am very opposite that in my thinking. And that actually has to do very much with post-Kantian thought, is because a lot of people say, this is very social, you really don't get this in the individual box, you have to look at the social dynamics of raising children. As I always like to mention, Hillary Clinton, of course, uh, wrote a book back in the day um, to support her husband's candidacy for the president, uh, and several other bills afterwards, that... You have, it takes a village to raise a child, and a Republican guy wrote a mock book parodying that called It Takes a Village to Raise an Idiot. And I always love quoting that, although I am far a bit from Republican myself. Is uh, funny jokes all around. Yes, we love it. So with all of that, and uh, joking aside, of course, It Takes a Village to Raise an Idiot and or Idiot Child, because, of course, self-consciousness and how conscious we are is a social construct. Now, there's a lot of times we may as well introduce the word social construct. There uh, were a series of memes that were funny uh, for a lot of people, the memes for the teenagers, a couple years ago now, for your time, perhaps, if you're like five, that there was Robin starting to say things and he's interrupted by Batman who slaps him and says something else interrupting him. And a couple of them are like, but objective reality or but human nature. And then Batman slaps him, you know, and says social construct and slaps him. Well, it is very, uh, very continental and a bit f uh, philosophy, more German French style, not so analytic. If somebody says, well, objective reality or human nature, 
you should immediately jump in with social construct. What that means is not there is no such thing as objective reality at all. Um, that's a lot of times how people understand it, as if we mean it's a dream, life is but a dream, just jump off a building, everything's fine. No, 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 no. I did see, and I often like to mention, there's a uh, one of the memes, again, where there's a crying white guy who looked kind of down and out getting put in the back of a squad car, and he's saying, no, you don't understand, postmodernism tells me I can believe in any reality I want, therefore you have to let me go. And of course it doesn't follow up with, as I often do, but the cops get to believe and make a paycheck any way they want. Just because reality is very subjective, that does not mean it's not a social construct and contract-ish plenty, not entirely legal, where you and the cops and everybody all behave and, and use English and believe things similarly. So just because things are a highly social construct and highly constructed, that does not mean anything about pure objective reality necessarily. But when people use the word social construct, they mean something like ficta, post-ficta, continental thought, which is not that the not, you know, and then here there's people online who are like, ah, see, the Nazis lied to you. That's the left wing because they're telling you to not believe in reality and believe in lies. Hopefully you understand me when I say that is not at all what's going on here. If you accept, say, that science and being white and being European or having or believing in democracy are all things we have to socially mentally do and we construct that every day when we go through motions, this is nothing other than saying that and then you can debate how objective or subjective all of that is. But with with this, and insofar as postmodernism does use language like this, this is very much that your identity, who I am to me, is something I socially learned and therefore I socially uh, perform. Judith Butler is perhaps the highest paid person in this town. I believe there are people paid more than me. I hope so. That she basically says reality, gender is a performance, and of course a lot of people may think, oh, then I can just be transgender, leap up and down, everything's whatever I want it to be, you know, oh, you millennials and all this stuff. What Judith Butler is clearly saying as a uh, lesbian woman who basically, and I am not, who has seen the lesbian scene represent itself and go through social changes, is saying, no, gender and identity is a per is action. It's what you do in the world, and whether or not you wear the pants well or not as to whether you're a woman or a man, and she's very right insofar as gender and uh, identity are going through certain motions. Now, after that, you could still have arguments about whether or not anything like pants are subjective or objective, but we're already getting into uh, forms of life territory here. Wittgenstein says forms of life. If you like social construct, the reason that social construct is confusing language, though, is because, of course, it sounds like we just purposefully go out and build our reality from scratch. No, you more go through the motions and use the pieces you've been handed. Heidegger later is going to say we're thrown into the world. And yeah, you don't get to just pick the world and that there's a word for turtles, but you are enacting the word turtles as well as I wear pants and wander around never in a skirt or a kilt, and that's me performing what I understand and enact as male, white, something, identities. So again, I don't feel all challenged by that. I think that's just like sort of anthropological understanding of stuff, if you get my drift. And that does in itself say whether or not if all this is a social construct, that's purely objective or subjective. You could get into it with Marxist thinkers and others as to whether or not identity, which Marxist thinkers would very much think it's a social construct as far as middle class identity, but a lot of Marxists would not say reality is subjective. They would say, no, that's objective, and a lot of Marxists believe in pure objective scientific reality. So a lot of people here, if they think, oh, it's Marxist to say to people it's social construct, therefore whiteness is just made up, and that's Marxist to lie to people, that truth is just lies. Believe me when I say there's actually a lot of positions hiding in here that aren't just obvious. You know, and Fichte is no Marxist. In fact, he didn't know of any of that, of course, but he would certainly not be if he did. Um, and yeah, he had no idea what Nazis nor communists are or any of that reacting back and forth to each other. But he's getting into that beforehand, of course. So this is very much that reality is, and there's a good word here called intersubjectivity. Objectivity is very much, at least very much, intersubjectivity. The ways that our subjectivities seem to line up and work is very much, if not entirely, what objective reality is. That is very much the idea. Notice that is like Kant individually going through experience like Hume and then saying, but the prejudices and the habits fill in the blank slate I am, and I think that there's more grooves in it. Hegel is not going to find so much grooves in it as much as he is going to say there's dance steps we do of it. 
So Fichte argued that it is through others that we find ourselves called to obedience as well as freedom, which is very true. We would socially only know constraint and lack of constraint through having relationships with others. A lot of this then is now leading up to anthropological thought and a bunch of thinking which is going to fill in our worlds and a lot of our science fiction and all of this stuff, of course, with German, French, and modern thought. Being as self-consciousness is, is a callings or a summons. Heidegger uses this, the call of being, in his later work, and he kind of is, uh, again, a little bit political with all that um the uh, the individual uh the i before freud before the ego which is actually jewish freud as an austrian guy using a greek word to impress his fellow german speaking guys and was still ostracized of course very much as jewish funny enough you have here Fichte is not using the ego he certainly is studying a lot of uh, greek words but he calls it das ich the I, as in the capital letter I, as in I, Eric, something or other, the I, like capital I, das Ich, I-C-H. So, that the I, the ego, now think, this is Freud's ego before Freud's ego, and Freud is very much getting a lot of German thought from, hey, what do you know? You know, his fellow German-Austrian, you know, whole Germanic, uh, again, we're going to get to the pessimism, how it's not entirely a uh, perfect empire, plenty. Um... That this is, Fichte is coming up with the I and that it asserts itself and that this drive of the I is a basic emotional form of reality. Well, that sounds like Freud's ego, doesn't it? Yeah, because this is very much Fichte coming up with basic Freud before Freud. And of course, there's many people like Hegel who are into this. And so, so is Freud and other people. And then Freud actually does say, oh no, my uh, my ideas look a lot like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche's, but actually that's just coincidental. Well, it is and it isn't. His ideas are his own. They're not entirely Schopenhauer and Nietzsche's. You can tell. And Freud also believes in objective scientific reality, which is not so much Schopenhauer or Nietzsche, certainly not. Um, they believe it is far more interpretation, which is much more Lacan and actually French psychoanalysis and French Freud. So... We're going to get to all these positions slowly, but you have here Freud's ego, except ego is the uh, ancient Greek word for self, whereas Fichte is using a very German basic word, the I, das Ich. It is in accord and against with this assertion of self that phenomena take place. It became a central idea for Hegel as well as Freud. And the I, for Fichte, discovers its limits through its interaction with others and the resistance, anstros, of others. Hegel's view of history and master-slave dialectic is very much founded, and we're going to get to the master-slave dialectic. I will do a whole video on that very much. The Hegel's master-slave dialectic is central for Marx. It's also central for plenty of progressive thought. It's central for plenty of feminists. It's central for plenty of anti-racist thinkers, and I happen to like anti-racism. And it's very much about overcoming the powers that be in their forms. So we're going to get to all of that and a lot of this stuff and why Americans are into and not into that so much. But Hegel follows Fichte and says, what we see in history and individual psychology is the individual and social movements going through a process of resistance and counter-resistance. That things like you have the dogma and that you have the culture and then you have the skepticism and the counterculture, and that art and history and the French Revolution work in terms of motion and counter-motion, which he is very much seeing as Newton which is physics is uh, for every motion there is an equal and opposite counter motion, which Hegel finds in history and the French Revolution. I had an experience I love to talk about um, as a preschooler. Now, I like getting into Piaget, and I won't get deep into Piaget, and I tend to mention Piaget a lot when I'm getting into Hegel because I am interested in how child developmental psychology works into all of this. I do recommend uh, Gopnik's The Philosophical Baby as a book, which gets into very basic Hume and some of this stuff, and you can talk about how babies do and don't understand themselves in the world, and of course, we don't understand that plenty, but Gopnik is, is one of the people who does clinical work and seeing when baby's eyes move to what, and then suggesting theory about how, and, well, doing experimentation and pushing forward theory about how 
our minds get into these positions originally. But what we are told, of course, is that when we're around three and four and we're learning language, we have experiences where we learn others exist and we have to have our perspectives kind of hammered into our heads back and forth in order to develop uh, that we are egos, we are selves, and there's other egos out there that want what they want and we have to learn how to negotiate all that. Hopefully you understand that without me talking more because I will talk more about all that a bunch. But we obviously aren't going to fill all that in right here. But I had an experience as a three-year-old or a four-year-old. I don't entirely remember. And that would be, uh, as I was delighted by as a three- or four-year-old, the oatmeal. You know, and again, not the comic. I That occasionally happens during the videos. So... The, uh, basically this is my story of Eric, the ego and the, uh, and the pinata, uh, the leg of the pinata. But anyway, I tell this story often to represent ego and self as basic dynamic in Fichte and in Freud and in Hegel and in German thought in general, in which our self desire and self is a basic kind of forward mechanism in things. So I actually went to a birthday party. Uh, I had a friend uh, from preschool when I was growing up, like three and four. And I wasn't much grown up. Again, that's when like five and six year olds were amazing intellectual people. And into getting into all of that, I had a friend, she was actually uh, half Chinese, half Korean. And she had a birthday party. And she had a pinata, which I am to understand is half Chinese and half Korean or entirely Mexican and what have you. And again, this is plenty California, and it was in the Arboretum of San Francisco. And uh, that basically there was a pinata, and people hit the pinata, and candy came out. And I think that was the first time I ever experienced a pinata, again, which I associate very much with half Korean culture. Again, the better half of Korea. You know which half I'm talking about. So basically, again, making joking jokes about German, <laughs> jokey jokes about German philosophy and idealistic thinking. So. Basically, I remember very much, though, I had an odd experience, which was kind of disturbing to my tiny little ego and mind, is that I remember very much, actually, she was the birthday girl, and she was standing there, and she had a leg of the pinata, and somebody had given her the leg of the pinata, I was grabbing candy, trying to find candy and stuff, and the kids were all that, I was three years old, or four, I don't know, maybe I should have known better, grown up another year, but... She was holding a leg of the pinata, and I saw the leg of the pinata, and I just, without thinking, because I was three, you know, whatever, I grabbed for it, and it was just like, I want that, and I didn't, and I remember her sort of being, hmm, and like yanking it back from me, and I definitely suddenly realized, it's sort of like, I definitely liked this person, I thought she was amazing, and she had never done, you know, there had never been any negativity, and suddenly she was definitely displeased with me, and all of a sudden, I was like, oh god, and I, and I realized, I just tried to grab for myself, and I had this moment of very much shame and like, oh, how could I be that? And of course, what psychologists suggest is we all go through motions like this, you know, with the pinata and the Korean birthday party is what I'm telling you, is that we all, of course, went to this same party with me in our minds. That clearly, of course, we all have moments where we better or worse, of course, with child development and yeesh, um, learn how to recognize others exist and go back and forth. There's a great Taoist story um, in the third most important Taoist work of ancient China, the Lietze, Master Lie, um, in which a man sees gold in the marketplace and he just grabs the gold and hurries off in the daylight. And when the cops grab him and they're asking him, what were you thinking? He says, at the time, I wasn't thinking much. I just saw the gold and I wasn't thinking of anybody else. Which is very much, of course, an absurdist story that's designed to say we just grab for ourselves in such ways and don't think of others. So as we begin to socialize, and Gopnik says in The Philosophical Baby, which is why I mention it, that children love Oscar the Grouch, and they like Cookie Monster, and figures like that. Why do they like that in Sesame Street for developmental psychologists who are helping them create all of that? Well, because children want to see characters who don't like what they like, and they're like, wow, that's funny, uh, Oscar the Grouch likes trash, that's icky, ha ha ha, because that helps children, psychologists argue, develop perspective, yes? And so, through all this, obviously, without getting onward from any of that, you can see, actually, how the self is kind of something like a direction and a force of, of feeling and or emotion and or passionate thought, and that direction then contradicts and encounters others, hits a wall here and there, and then has to adjust. And this is what uh, Fichte is saying, which is going to become proto-Freud and thus 
psychology. And of course, it is very common to still believe in the name of psychology, not in necessarily in the Freudian ego, but something like self-assertion, the, say, primordial state of human emotions, and child development. And so it's plenty fine to notice the history of these ideas, and then of course understand we've plenty much, uh, I am sure, psychology has extended to and added to these ideas such that it is quite unrecognizable in plenty of ways, given this and that theory. But this is very much the Germanic origins of some Freud and some psychology plenty. Unfortunately, Fichte became a bit too social, as already mentioned and joked on several a times, because I'm a Germanic American, therefore I don't have any later hosen. Um, I don't know what Germanic holidays are at all. I think there's pretzels and beer somewhere in the world um, uh, during some kind of month. I'm not sure which one. Maybe in the, uh, in the, yes, in the Festivus for the rest of us. But... Basically, Fichte somewhat was a little too social in hearing the call of proto-German nationalism, and or, as we always say in modern European philosophy, he was a man of his time, you know, as was Fanon far later. So, although he was black and from Martinique and heard a very different call, and it wasn't uh, German nationalism. So... Fichte also, unfortunately, dabbled plenty and trafficked and trucked in anti-Semitism and misogyny that he very much was saying insofar as Jews and women are trying to fight in their ways and get more so rights, Wollstonecraft in France is going on as a proto-feminist uh, in the uh, 1780s, so... Feminists are starting to get going and saying maybe we should give women more rights and stuff, and even those suggestions are oftentimes very modest compared to what we're thinking of or even already practicing today. And Fichte very much at the time is like, nah, we're not, we should not let Jewish people or women into the state with equal rights as we're increasingly giving white guys, we're not calling white guys yet entirely because they're German males who are, pro, uh, you know, we're slowly extending the rights and the properties too. And in fact, Germany... Again, somewhat did not have the, uh, as we'll get to German pessimism, you've heard of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the German Revolution? Probably not. And that has to do with some of this stuff back and forth. Germany had a lot of ideas. Uh, they had, uh, in some ways, fewer practices uh, than the Americans and the French. So, many Nazis, unsurprisingly many of whom are intellectuals happy to get into all kinds of German thinkers, are far more into Fichte than Hegel and plenty of that. And they identify Hegel very much. In fact, Americans have uh, avoided Hegel a lot. That Hegel is very much identified with Marx and communism, and the communist world has not tried to dissuade that because they teach a lot of Hegel and then how Marx overcomes Hegel, of course, as Marx would for communists. And I'll talk all about that when we get more to Hegel after Schelling, and I'm going to break off this talk pretty much here. I knew, again, as with this stuff, I can talk about Fichte and a bunch of basics, and then we already have a bunch of material. I've talked through some of the basics, and then I've spent my time on Fichte giving ideas that will be very important, and I'll constantly be nodding back to, throughout the Germans and the French people we will be discussing, as well as some of the Americans who take from these ideas. So, Fichte, like the Nazis, who would rise over a hundred years after his death, believed in the original German people, the Volk, it's again spelled Volk for the Americans, which is like the Volkswagen, the people's car. Later, Nietzsche rejected German nationalism and anti-Semitism, which he saw as a source of weakness and fear. Nietzsche, even though he was very much a man of his time, liked to be something like an anti-anti-Semite, he called himself and something thus like an anti-racist because Nietzsche believes in being a staunch individualist. He doesn't like religion or scientific objectivity as much as he likes religious and scientific individuals who push cultures forward in spite of culture's selves. Uh, the social identity, yes, and the kind of... Uh, the weight and the inertia of the social ego. And Nietzsche likes individuals who break apart from it. And so he doesn't like German nationalism and what uh, anti-Semitism and what Fichte is seeing in his time. I have to say, for Nietzsche's credit, he had Jewish and female friends. And as a guy of his time who very much says brutal things that people don't like to see in print so much at all, he very much realized Nietzsche did early on, and that part of him as an imperfect person is amazing, that if you have a multicultural group of friends, you definitely know why individualism would be worthwhile, you know, whether or not you like anything like nationalism, is that leaving it politically wide open here, way wider than I often do, is that you can understand why individualism, I grew up in the 1980s, when nationalism and individualism were very much wedded together somewhat with Reaganism, um, which is somewhat imperfect in and of itself, let's not say otherwise. 
the right here. Again, we got a lot to cover before we get to Marx, let alone Reagan. Um, but Nietzsche is very much rejecting a lot of this. So you find in German thought, not just German Nazi stuff, you find a back and a forth and a back and a forth to every back and a forth, and then unfortunately plenty Nazis. So Heidegger, though, after Nietzsche, who wants to be the next Nietzschean guy and post-Hegelian German philosopher who writes long, confusing books, Heidegger embraces the idea of the German folk through the lens of Fichte, seeing it as a source of unity and strength, and says, well, we have to be individualist, interpretationist people, very proto-existential, but we also, before Sartre calls it existentialism, but we also could be social in our interpretations, which may or may not be the hippies, or, of course, the Nazis. Yes, straight to Hitler again with everything. So, much love and happiness. Hopefully today you aren't going straight to Hitler. Um, and leave all that alone. Again, don't learn about your German nationalism or idealism or pessimism on the street from improper Germanics. Listen to this Germanic here. Tune in next week. Uh, again, same bat time and the Gotham possibly Batman deserves. But I will, again, be talking more about Germans and French people and other thinkers. Oh, my. And I will see you, and hopefully you'll be listening if I ever see you.